Thanks, guys. And without further ado, uh, let's get our panelists on up with us. Um, this is an important subject for us because ultimately this thing comes down to numbers and cash flow. Um, we need to get the balance right. We need to make the project stack up. So let's, ha let's figure out how do we do that. So to have that conversation, we have Juan. Do you want to come and join us, Juan? Uh, Aguila, who's a corporate director at Katara. Um, and then Abdullah, you're going to come and join us. Abdullah's come down from Ras Al Khaimah. He's got a fabulous project up in Ras Al Khaimah, and we're going to find out a little bit more about that in a minute. And then JD, Jadav, Menezes is going to join us. Um, we're going to see a lot more from uh, Ima Hospitality and uh, later on today, certainly this evening, so it's great to have him with us. And also Jeff, Jeff Deesdale um, from FRHI Hotels and Resorts. Um, so we're going to break this into two. The first bit we're going to look at is mixed use and what is mixed use and why we need to look at mixed use. And then the next bit we're going to get on to is then thinking about branded residential, which of course is a key part of mixed use. But just to set the scene for us, um, what is mixed use? There's an Urban Land Institute definition of mixed use, and essentially the point there is it's three or more land uses which together have a strong synergy, and essentially they should be stronger than the sum of the parts. That's the ambition there. It should be coherent and integrated. It can be vertical mixed use, like a big tower, like the Shard, which is essentially a mixed use project, or it can be a horizontal mixed use project. The idea is that we're balancing our markets, we're reducing risk, um, and there should be some synergies between those. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea, that's the uh, uh, sort of introduction. Um, we haven't got terribly long, we've got a lot around to cover, um, but gentlemen and Abdullah, to start with, um, how developed is mixed use in the Middle East? And this is a prime opportunity for you to tell us a little bit about what's happening in Ras Al Khaimah. Yeah, uh, if we start speaking about the mixed use development. And if we speak about the history of a mixed use development, it's to start with the zoning and being an urban planner. And in the 1920s, 1950s, the idea started of a mixed use development from the zoning. And in the late century, and to, uh, in 2000, uh, in current situation, it starts to uh, have the identity of the mixed-use development that incorporate all of the uses in one place. And that has a reason. It encourages all of the people to utilize the same place. It encourages all the people to feel the identity of pedestrian living, of the environment, of the authenticity of the place. If we speak about our development, for example, and which is El Marjan Island development, El Marjan Island is the iconic mixed-use real estate development in the Emirate of Ras Al Khaimah. It extends around 4.5 kilometer into <coughs> the Arabian Gulf, covering an area of 2.7 million square meter. Mm -hmm. What we created, we created the destination, and we choose that as a slogan: "Your favorite destination," and that mixed-use development. Why it is your favorite destination? Because you enjoy it as a visitor, you enjoy it as a resident, your kids enjoy it, you work at it, you enjoy the facilities inside it, you enjoy the experience out of it. So it's not just only for you as a user or as a visitor, but it's for everyone, for an investor. Okay. for people who are thinking. This is the challenge right now we are facing, how to create an experience. And especially nowadays, people are thinking about introducing the public realm as a key factor for the whole mixed-use development. And that has an impact on the overall. Okay. From a financial perspective, if we, we would like to, to mention it or to state it. Mixed use development are the best development to develop. Hotels, resorts, real estate, residential units, re, uh, retail components and offices. Okay, perfect. So there's an economic argument. JD, anything to add to that? Because EMAR, of course, as we know, you've done a few of these before as a company. Um, what role does a hotel play compared to some of the other components. I mean, why do I have to have a hotel? I mean, come on, let's face it, there are other ways of making money, right? Yeah, sure, <laughs> I think uh, to first compliment what uh, Abdullah mentioned, 
I think key here is, I mean, the UAE is clearly a pioneer in uh, mixed use. Uh, Dubai particularly has, uh, has set the precedent for developing, designing, and operating mixed use. At MR Properties, uh, we took 500 acres of army barracks, essentially, barren land, and created what we created with the Burj Khalifa downtown Dubai. Um, and, you know, I think it's set a great example for other mixed use developments in the region. Um, last year, I think 2015, we had 80 million visitors uh, at uh, downtown Dubai. Coming back to your question on hotels, I think hotels and, you know, question of branding and uh, the development, I think they both complement each other. Um, I don't think, you know, it's led by the branding of the hotel versus the branding of the uh, development. I think uh, they're both complementary in terms of uh, helping position the overall uh, development. Mm -hmm. Juan, a hotel within a mixed-use scheme, um, essentially we've got other commercial space, we've got entertainment, other parts of the scheme. Does the profile of the hotel that you put in an integrated mixed-use project, does it change? Or is it, it's your standard model hotel, this is what you have to do, you have to have these things. Or is it twisted and slightly different if you jump it in a mixed-use project? Well, it's true that you have to adapt each hotel project to whatever you want to place it. If it's part of a mixed-use development, definitely you have to adapt it to it. Why you bring a hotel into a mixed-use development is because you want to add value, and in this case, it's service. We as Qatar Hospitality, we are hotel developers, but regardless, if you want to create a destination, as Abdullah was saying before, service is a must, and that's why you need a, uh, a yeah. hotel that provides additional services to residences, as we're discussing today, branded residences. Mm -hmm. So trying to create a value just by creating the product is not enough. Uh, our customers are looking for service. We all travel a lot, whether for business or for leisure, uh, and we know that we, when, we, when we go to hotels, if the service is not there, the experience is not there. No matter how good our room is or the facilities are, you need service, and that's why you have to, to push the operator to provide that level of service that puts mm -hmm. your development at a different level. Okay. Now, Jeff, you're involved with some extraordinary brands, but more often than not, Abdullah's point is one, you've got a project which is a brand in its own count. So who wins in that battle over brands? And what brands do you have, and, and, and how do you work with developers of mixed-use schemes when you have the battle over this is the, the, the Fairmont at or is it the name of the destination and then the brand? How does that relationship work? Because that could be an argumentative, tricky one, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose it has the potential. We don't, we don't view it through that lens. I think, generally speaking, when we look at the residential branding, uh, there's obviously a lot that the brand brings. It brings distribution, uh, the brand in terms of the occupancy, the bed base it provides. Obviously, that's integral to the, to the footfall. The dynamics of the, of the hotel occupancy are often very complementary to the occupancy that's driven by the appeal of the mixed-use development in, itself, which tends to draw uh, often from a local market. And, and so in terms of that potential tension, we, we, we view it more as complementary. So the, the residential branding, uh, particularly for offshore buyers, we find that branding resonates uh, very significantly for our development partners when they're trying to target offshore buyers. Uh, it certainly is integral to the distribution side of the equation. But the flip side is, I mean, when, you know, our development partners include the likes of, obviously, of Katara, of the Aqua Group, uh, and, and developers of, uh, you know, very similar caliber. And so their corporate branding and the branding that they're developing for their mixed-use developments are, are absolutely integral to the success. And if you look at a residential sale, for instance, the branding that we bring, the luxury branding, whether that's Raffles, Fairmont, or Swiss Hotel, is obviously core to the story, but so is that credibility that comes from our corporate partner and from our development partner. And, and we're very cognizant of the fact that our buyers have to have confidence, not only is the development partner going to build a luxury product, deliver on time, and, and deliver consistently with the, the vision, the specifications, and the like of the, of the product, but at the, at the same time, they also have to have similar trust in the brand, that the brand's gonna mm -hmm. safeguard their asset and ensure that the great product that's delivered at the front end is one that they can enjoy for years to come. Okay. Now, we're going to move on to branded residences in a second, but before we do, um, I'm going to put you on the spot, guys, and you're not allowed to mention your own project, okay? 
Um, if we wanted to go home, do our homework, and do a bit of research into integrated mixed-use schemes, can you name me one project that you think is a really good example of where it all kind of comes together quite nicely, um, either in the UAE or somewhere in the, else in the world, where we can go away and do our homework and say, okay, that was mentioned, we've never done this before, let's look at mixed use, what's a great example? Juan, let's go that way. So <laughs> you're okay, Jeff, you've got a bit of time to think. Okay, it's hard to say um, uh, which products are working better than the ones that you really believe on. Yeah. But uh, to answer your questions, I would say uh, the Four Seasons uh, mixed use development in Miami. Miami. Okay. Really Abdullah, well done. you're not allowed to mention your own. We know about of your project. Of course. But we, okay, so when you looked yeah. at your project and you did your homework and your research, which other places around the world did you look at and say, you know, that was a great case study for us? That was a really good example and we've tried to learn some lessons. Look, the, the most successful project, honestly, has been built within the region in the UAE as a mixed use development. We believe that Imar has did a great job in Burj Khalifa area. That was nice of him, wasn't it? That, yeah. was, that was perfect. <laughs> that wasn't fixed at all. So, Ima, so now without, without feeling duty bound at this no, point. No, I think, I think, look, <laughs> no, I think regardless, Imar has done, you know, uh, downtown Dubai, uh, Marina, and uh, Dubai Creek. That aside, I think one in the region that I think is new and has taken off and is coming together quite nicely is the Miras development, the City Walk development, with retail, F and B, uh, the hotel components, the resi pieces. So I think that that that's that's come together well and seems to be working. Perfect, well. Jeff. Last one. Well, well, I, I will say, and I thought JD might throw us one there, but uh, I, I will say Burj Khalifa here in Dubai is spectacular. And you know, having lived here for five years, I'm now based in Singapore. It's, it's a wonderful development. Uh, where I'm based now in Singapore, uh, I look to Sentosa Re Resort and uh, Marina Bay Sands, and I say that because I think those two mixed-use developments of spectacular scale, but similar to some of the mega projects that we've seen here, they've also played a, a really critical and pivotal role in the transformation of those destinations, moving from really economies from a hospitality perspective that were based more on corporate and business, and really allowing them to make that uh, transition into true leisure destinations, which, uh, as we know, is no easy feat. Okay. Right. Branded residences seems to be a growth sector. It's not a little bubble that's going to disappear. Um, to start with, Jeff, this is a tricky one. I want you to give 30 seconds on what do you mean by branded residences, just for people who may not have come across them before. Uh, branded residences are typically co-located in a mixed-use development. They're branded, uh, in our case, by uh, leading hospitality brands, which means that they're uh, built to brand specifications. Uh, and as importantly, they're managed then to those uh, same specifications. And so under both the Fairmont, the Raffles, and the Swiss Hotel brand, one of our points of pride is to ensure that not only do we work with our partners to brand and develop a great product, but our teams are there to work with the owners of those private residences once the individual units are, are sold. And so we're there with our partner and with the resulting purchasers for the long term. Okay, so is a branded residence always appropriate or is it only under certain circumstances is the next question. Juan, and, and is this something that Katara is getting into more and more? Most brands are. Can you do them anywhere? Where's appropriate? Well, I mean, there's... Um Picking up on what uh, Jeff uh, was saying, I mean, there's, there's several ways to not just stick to your, yourself to branded residences by a hotel. Yep. Definitely, it serves like a good platform to start with, but there's many other brands that you can bring into your branded residences, whether it's a designer. We as Qatar Hospitality, we have a partnership with a major brand designers, better interior designers. So we're going to build into our projects more than just one brand. Okay. Of course, we have a great partnership with uh, FRHI and Devina Levels. We've we'll been working with several projects with them, but we want to, to build on top of that okay. so you can bring more branding okay. into your own branded residences. All right. On your island, have you got any branded residential? Is there any coming? And if so, why have you put them on there? In our island, till now, we don't have there is coming in the pipeline and the reason behind the branded residence and we discovered based on the studies that people prefer to have branded residence for their longer stays 
okay. within the hotels rather than having the hotel keys. And that's what drives us to have that <coughs> development within our okay. development. There are a few are comings right now with different operators, and this is honestly an increasing uh, demand. There is an increasing demand on that subject in, in, in our market in Ras al Khaimah. Okay. We're going to do two questions that always come up now. Uh, I'm going to start with a physical question, then I'm going to start with a numbers question. I'm, JD, I'm going to go to you first. I'm sorry about it. But what is the magic? Is there, is there a magic ratio between the number of keys in your hotel? and the number of branded residence units you have in your scheme, or is it completely dependent on the, on the project and, and the case at a time? I think uh, it, it is dependent. I think fundamentally our DNA as MR, and, uh, MR properties and MR hospitality group has been, uh, we've been very successful doing branded residential and uh, operating and developing strong hotels. So. Our view on doing hotel and branded residential is very complementary to each other. Uh, we see a huge number of synergies. As a developer, we see synergies from pricing premium, sales velocity, um, you know, as Jeff mentioned, uh, I think things like rental and managing uh, rental yields, running rental pools and rental programs, I think. So we see it as very much integrated, uh, both the, the hotel and the residential component. In fact, um, Address residences today, I mean, so we've got, we, we have today six hotels that we own and operate, four address and two Vida, both have residential extensions. Uh, address residences are premium luxury, Vida is a boutique upscale product, uh, a boutique upscale brand. Uh, we've just launched Rove, which is our contemporary mid-scale, and yesterday we launched Rove Satwa, which is our seventh Rove uh, location in Dubai, and Rove Home, which is the branded extension even for contemporary mid-scale so our argument is that it doesn't just work for it does work for luxury obviously yeah but we do see value in certain locations even at the mid-scale segment if i do 100 keys a hotel how many residence units have you got a uh, a magic number our, our ratios will be completely different for example right okay. so address i mean for example our typically our hotels are 200 keys uh, historically, uh, we have done up to five, six hundred address residences, for example, that complement the hotel. Um, other operators may look at it and, and flip that ratio. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for us, it's very much project dependent, very market dependent. All right. And then the big numbers question. What is the premium that you get if you have an unbranded apartment compared to a branded apartment within the same project? Same unit, same everything. One's with a brand. I know there's not going to be one single number, but what are the kind of numbers that get talked about, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a very important question. It, uh, it, it comes up uh, almost universally in our meetings with our development partners. Uh, we very, very confidently say to our development partners that when they brand a residence with the Fairmont brand or with the Raffles brand or the Swiss Hotel brand, that they should be able to confidently expect a premium of 15 to 20%. Uh, now, we've taken a look at external research uh, and global studies that have found that that premium is in excess of 30%, and certainly anecdotally within our own portfolio, we've worked on projects uh, where the premium has significantly exceeded that, both under the Fairmont brand and a project in, in Vancouver where the premium was closer to 50, and then similarly on a project in, the capital, or in uh, Manila, uh, in McCaddy, where the premium was uh, with Kingdom uh, and now Ayala was again plus 30%, 90% of the project was sold off plan. The products to set records for the highest priced apartments sold in the Philippines at the time, uh, as well as the highest achieved price per square meter. Uh, so there's a lot of good research, including third party research, but uh, a critically important question, obviously, for development partners. And just to add to that, of course, we all, everybody be conscious when people talk about percentages and when you do your analysis, a percentage is only one very blunt tool. It's actually the real value, because 10% in London is very different to 10% in some other cities, right? So it's the real value as well as the percentage. OK, so that was the topic. That was the interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, guys, for your time. Much appreciated. And we're going to see more mixed use, and we're going to see more branded residences. So thank you very much. Thank you.